Okay, before we get started today, I'd like to quickly remind you all that we have some great bird books available here at Wallace, such as these here. We have a large selection available through the Pines catalog as well, so if we don't have what you want here, you can look up what's available at gapines.org and use your library card to have what you want sent here for you to pick up in person or via curbside. For more assistance, your friendly library staff is here to answer your phone calls at 706-722-6275, Monday through Friday, 9 a.m. to 5 p.m., and Saturdays, 11 a.m. to 2.30 p.m. Alrighty, enjoy the rest of the talk. So, hi there again, I'm Matthew, and today for this month's Wallace Branch Bird Talk, we're going to be taking a look at our summer resident oriole, the orchard oriole. We'll go over identification, ecology, behavior, where to find them, and even give some tips about how to encourage them to visit your own backyard. So without further ado, let's begin. So starting off with identification. Overall, orchard orioles are smallish blackbirds with slender bills, squared off tails, dark eyes, and dark wings. They're also the smallest of the North American Orioles, being about 15 to 18 centimeters, or around 6 to 7 inches, with males being slightly larger than the females. So we have two adults here, the female on the left with her mostly yellow-green plumage with dull black wings that have buffy edges, and the male on the right with his jet black and rusty orange feathers with much more stark white edging on the wings. As stated before, males are also about an inch bigger than the females. Uh, in the summer, this is the only oriole you're likely to see in our area, so they're very easy to identify up in the tops of trees. Females look more or less the same as juveniles and, and adults, with the juveniles being a little duller and more brown overall. Males that have just become independent look a bit like females, but when they molt all their baby feathers in their second year, something interesting happens, and we're going to see that on the next slide. So male orioles in their second summer have a similar yellow-green as the females, only with that striking black mask that you see on the picture on the right, and are a little brighter overall. When they're in this plumage, they kind of look like some of the more southwesterly orioles, but don't fret, we don't see any of those here, so all you have to remember is that yellow oriole with a black mask equals second year male. According to the University of Michigan School of Zoology, these males are able to nest at this stage, but rarely do so because females prefer older, more orange males. So on the left, we have a young male who's molting into his rusty adult plumage. It's worth pointing this out here because when they're in the stage, they look very different from their other plumages and can make birders think it's a completely different species. Just want to point that out. And one more thing, uh, this is something we'll probably never see here, but this is the Fuertes subspecies of orchard oriole that breeds in the northeast Mexico and winters in southwest Mexico. This is an adult male, and you can see how he's much more peach colored than rust colored. Again, we'll likely never see one of these around here, but I thought it was interesting enough to point out. So now that we've talked about identification, let's move on to ecology and behavior. Like the ruby-throated hummingbirds we talked about last month, orchard orioles are big fans of flower nectar. However, fruits and insects make up a large part of their diet as well, certainly more so than with hummingbirds. During the breeding season, insects make up the bulk of their diet, but in other seasons, they subsist more off of fruits like choke cherries and other berries, as well as nectar from flowers. In their wintering ranges of Central and South America, they rely heavily on flowers like mistletoe and the insects that live among its foliage. While they're not fans of bird seed, you can potentially attract orchard orioles to your yard by leaving out orange halves and or grape jelly in a bowl for them. They've also been known to visit hummingbird feeders from time to time. Remember, nectar in hummingbird feeders is one part sugar to five parts water. 
It needs to be changed every two to three days to prevent it from fermenting and making the birds drunk. Orchard Orioles are fairly docile and not strongly territorial. According to the Audubon Society, it's not uncommon for several pairs to nest in the same tree. The University of Michigan's School of Zoology even goes so far as to state that they'll even nest close to birds of other species and warn other birds of danger, which isn't too uncommon behavior among bird species, but it's still pretty cool. In the winter, these birds forage in flocks. Uh, it should be noted though that fully mature males will defend foraging and nesting territories against second year males. Poor guys can't catch a break, huh? Typically, orchard oriole songs are a series of whistles with the occasional harsh interjection given mainly to attract mates more so than to defend territories. They are also, um, sometimes they can give a mildly gruff whistle call or a squeaky t uh, Nests are hanging baskets built out of grasses, Spanish moss, and other plant fibers placed in the fork of a tree, typically 10 to 20 feet up. The female will lay and incubate usually four to five eggs for about two weeks, then both parents will feed the young for around another two weeks before the young leave the nest. According to the Audubon Society's All About Birds page for the Orchard Oriole, the young will hang around one or both parents for another couple of weeks before striking out completely on their own. Nesting occurs typically from May through August and orchard orioles typically only nest once a season unless the first nest is accidentally destroyed very early in the season. So now let's talk a little bit about their range and habitat. So for those of you who have tuned in before, this type of range map should look pretty familiar. This one comes from the Cornell Lab of Ornithology. Uh, for those of you who are unfamiliar with these kinds of maps, that's okay. All you need to know is that the orange areas are their summer range, the blue is their winter range, and the yellow is their migratory path, um, but I'm not sure why they don't show their overwater path. Uh, they just kind of show their overland, but generally most of them will fly nonstop over the Gulf of Mexico in the spring or fall but you'll see where some fly over the Caribbean as well. Uh, according to eBird, they generally start appearing here in Augusta around the beginning of April and are typically gone by September. So now is a great time to start looking for them. As for habitat, they generally like open woodland type areas near bodies of water, like rivers, lakes, um, however, in the western part of their range, they can be found in shrublands as well. According to Cornell, uh, orchard orioles are more communal in more suitable habitat, like river edges, and are less tolerant of each other in less suitable habitat. On their winter range, they can be found on coffee plantations, open and lightly wooded areas, and the same kinds of habitats you'd find them in around here. Okay, so let's wrap all this up with a few fun facts about orchard orioles. So the oldest known orchard oriole was recaptured during a banding project and was estimated to be nine years old. Um, as stated before, orchard orioles are loosely, loosely colonial and will warn other birds of impending danger, including uh, birds of other species. In turn, they respond to distress calls of other bird species as well. Even though some pairs may not be done raising young by the end of August, some individuals will start their fall migrations as early as July. They're very, very early to migrate in the fall. Uh, in a surprising twist, greater roadrunners in the southwestern part of the Orchard Orioles range have been observed preying on our diminutive orange friend here. I know we all know road runners from the old cartoons, you know, being chased by the coyote, but what we're not told is how they're actually very savvy predators in their own right. And finally, like all mainly frugivorous or fruit-eating birds, 
Orchard Orioles are important to plant dispersal. The seeds from the fruits that they eat survive digestion and are deposited in new areas via the bird's droppings. Sort of a very important role in the ecosystem. Pretty cool, huh? So that's all I have for today. These are the sources I got today's information from. So if you want to learn more about these wonderful birds, I highly suggest checking these out. Um, I'll hold these up for a second so you can pause the video if you want to jot these down, look these up yourself. Um, go ahead, I highly encourage you to do so. And like I said at the beginning of the video, you can always use your Pines card to put some great bird books on hold at gapines.org or call any of our libraries for more assistance. So on behalf of the Augusta Richmond County Library System, I'd like to thank you for tuning in and I wish you happy birding. Bye.